We didn't arrange the weather, but it's really, really lovely to see you here with us today. For those of you that I don't know very well, I think there's just one person I'm meeting for the first time today. I'm Reverend Laura Cowden, and I'm the Minister of Congregational Care at Unity Church Unitarian. And I thank Mary for doing this video for us, Mary from Mueller memorials. We're doing this video for us to send to the family and friends on the West Coast. I'm glad that you're here with us, at least virtually. And thank you for sending all the remembrances, some of which you will hear in a moment. We are here today to witness the burial of Reverend Frederick Turner Coyle, known as Rick, and to say goodbye. Blessed are those who give meaning to our lives. Holy and precious is the example they leave behind. May our sorrows diminish as we recall their strength. May their wisdom protect us and help us to live. Let our grief be transformed into tenderness for those who are still with us. This wreath, though it may look plain, is actually imbued with symbolism and respect. It is a custom in our Unitarian Universalist tradition to lay an ivy wreath for the memorial service of a deceased minister as a means of honest honoring a minister's contribution to the movement and accordingly a symbolic recognition of their professional status. The shape of a circle symbolize collegiality and friendship, and of course is related to the circles used by our denomination, symbolic of the universality of our cause. The ivy, being evergreen, is an expression of the immortality of personality, as well as the living tradition of the faith itself. This wreath has been provided by the Unitarian Universalist Association to express lasting respect and affection for the leadership and service, the life and witness of one who has been a faithful Unitarian Universalist professional. Rick Coyle was born on October 25, 1944. Frederick Turner Coyle II. He dropped the second at some point after his father died. He was born in New York City and he grew up there and attended boarding school at Deerfoot Academy in Deerfield, Deerfield, Massachusetts. And Rick is remembered by his Deerfield classmates as a truly remarkable individual who didn't fit easily into the mold of the all Deerfield boy. Spencer Block, now retired professor of mathematics from University of Chicago wrote, frankly, I always thought he was the most brilliant person in our class. Rick did not confine himself by the dictates of conventionality. <laughs> I just heard some amens. <laughs> so true. Against the recommendations of Deerfield placement faculty, Rick applied to and was admitted by Princeton. He spent his first weeks introducing himself to his new classmates and was elected president of the freshman class. And then he dropped out. Rick graduated from Columbia Law School and took a job with a large firm in San Francisco and he hated keeping track of six minutes of work, one-tenth of an hour for billing purposes. He was also deeply unhappy with his firm defending contractors who built condominiums with plumbing that wasn't hooked up to city sewers and multitudes of other problems. After a while, he went into private practice. Rick tutored law students as they prepared for the bar exam, 
and he taught courses in ethics for attorneys who had violated the law and so were required to take ethics classes. Rick sought teaching jobs, but his timing was not good because his applications came at a time when the mostly male faculty law schools were hiring mostly women. But being on the West Coast brought Rick closer to some cousins, especially Alice Kaysberg and Peter Blewett, who have been sharing their memories of Rick and to whom I am very grateful for many of these remembrances that I can share with you all today. Alice styles herself as the family historian, and I will say I believe that to be true. Around 1981-82, Rick took an Alcoholics Anonymous self-assessment test and was shocked to see that his score was twice the threshold of indicating an alcoholic. He began attending AA meetings. The AA program included coming to accept that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. This step led him into the Unitarian Universalist Church and eventually into attending the Star King School for the Ministry and developing meaningful friendships, including with Reverend Daniel Cantor, who is now Unit at, at First Unitarian Church in Dallas, Texas. And Daniel writes, Rick had a glimmer in his eyes, an intelligent, devilish, funny, knowing, delighted glimmer. He would rock back and say, how delightful to something he loved, or lean in and cock an eyebrow up and question thoughtfully, question and then diffuse it with a pun or a play on words. Rick was a lawyer. He never stopped being a lawyer, so he fought like a lawyer. But he also fancied himself a renaissance man, who was, in fact, well-read, wrote with precision, built furniture by hand, taught writing classes, and how to pass the bar exam. A pilot, he loved baseball and the pastoral slowness of the game, and he loved ministry. He was a funny and sharp preacher who only pulled punches to challenge his listeners. And as a friend, he was loyal and took joy in your successes. He changed his life to spend a year in Dallas with us and he became Uncle Rick to my children and enjoyed every minute of the time with our family, mostly because I think he never had one of his own. He could also be a royal pain in the butt. And I mostly forgave him all that because I loved him and his pixie-like perk and his sharp wit and mind and how he tried to love the ones he cared about. Many days were spent with Rick at the ballpark, in discernment circle, camping in the desert in California, visiting over a couple scrambled eggs and toast. Years ago, he once said as he pointed to a new pair of work boots he liked to wear, it's strange to buy something that you know will live past your life. I think what he meant was he was leaving behind artifacts of his life because he wasn't sure what else would live on after he was gone. What lives in me is his wry smile, a few good pieces of advice, and the memory of a friendship that we once had a long time, interrupted by dementia and his slow decline a thousand miles away from Dallas. While in seminary, Rick also met Rebecca Ann Parker, who wrote, We spent seven years together, and though we went our separate ways for good reasons, I have always wished him well. He used to write me what he called plain letters to take with me when I went on a trip, which was a constant part of my professional life in those days. The letters were charming and touching. He was a very fine writer. Ordained in 2003 as a UU minister, Rick served in interim assistant and sabbatical ministries in Seattle, Cedar Rapids, Dallas, and Thunder Bay, Ontario. And when Rick became incapacitated, Rob and Jan Eller Isaacs helped him to relocate to St. Paul, Minnesota, where he often participated in 
training worship associates at Unity Church Unitarian based on a worship associates program that he had developed and written back in 1996 in Oakland. Rick regularly attended Unity Unitarian's A New Look at the Bible that Paul Gaty coordinates. And during that time, he started writing his memoirs. A 400 page document entitled, Who Knew How Beautiful and Bittersweet This Life Could Be? It's full of Rick's wry humor and keen insights. And along with the late reverends Rob and Jan Eller Isaacs, members of Unity's care team, Hal Freshley and Paul Gaty and others have been faithful visitors to Rick at his residence over the years. Reverend Rick Coyle will be remembered and honored during the service of living tradition at this year's General Assembly in June. I've been receiving many messages and remembrances of Rick to share here with you today. Reverend Kathleen will join me in reading these. This is from Deb Woodburn, friend. I learned to ride a motorcycle in 2001 at the age of 55 on a basic bike. I liked it. Rick and I talked about riding and he shared his stories about riding in Mexico as a young man when he was much freer, riding and sleeping wherever. And after several years when I wanted to buy a better fitting bike, he was tickled that I would give him the old one. The deal was that I would give him the old bike, but if ever he, I wanted the bike back, I could get it back. So the lawyerly Rick drew up an agreement saying as much as, saying as much, and we both signed it. When we went to the DMV to transfer the title, we learned we couldn't just transfer the title, there had to be a sale. So Rick paid me and dutifully amended the original agreement to include the sale price of $10. He enjoyed writing. We found a few friends from AA to ride with. On a Sunday afternoon, he and I rode down along the Mississippi River to Red Wing, Minnesota, the home of Red Wing Boots. He so wanted to get a new pair, but he knew they could be expensive. He made me promise to not let him buy a new pair. A lot of good that did. He bought a new pair anyway. Maybe he did outlast his original pair of boots. Rick listened to me talk about my dysfunctional family when my beloved mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My mother had written some poetry in her later years, some of it schlock, some of it quite good. But when I found the poems, I knew I would be too emotional to read them. So Rick read them in my stead, transcribing them, and even editing some of the better pieces. I think he enjoyed the ministerial work of helping me and learning about someone's life. This is from Rick's cousin, Martin Goodo. My main memory of Rick is what a fiend he was with baseball knowledge. As a teenager, he could answer just about any baseball trivia question. When I visited Rick and Alice and Fred in 1959, he really introduced me to baseball and made me a lifelong fan. He was a die-hard Yankee fan then. Not surprisingly, he quickly became a fan of the hapless early Mets. And this from Peter L. Blewett, cousin. I lost a dear friend today. It seems a rather odd thing to say, given that I have not spoken to Rick in over 20 years. Rick took me under his wing. He was more than 15 years my senior, but we constantly spent time together and he always treated me as an equal. Probably my favorite memory is the many evenings sitting in the living room in his Albany home talking about just, just about everything in both of our lives. Rick was a phenomenal reader, writer. I still have the copy of E.B. White's The Elements of Style that he gave me so that I could get through AP English. He spent many hours in that same living room working out what was wrong with most of my papers. Rick was an incredible teacher. From Rick's friend, Lynn Edwards. I can say that he became a trusted friend at a time when I really needed one and that I valued his advice and perspectives on life. 
I remembered something I heard from Rick when, which I'm sure he learned from his own experience. To hold one's anger until compassion was also present, and only then address the person who triggered the anger. I had occasion yesterday to use his advice, and the result was a small miracle for which I thank him. And this also from Rebecca Ann Parker Friend. Dear Rick, may you rest peacefully now in the embrace of the good earth. You brought many good gifts into my life when we shared life together in the 90s, and I was honored to support your journey during those years. Thank you for accompanying me through some hard times and giving me the nourishment and adventures, hiking the green hills, camping in the desert, and flying to beautiful places in California and Oregon. You love the sparkling waters of the Metolius River, and I will remember you this way, sitting with contentment at the shores of the river. In the end, gratitude is what remains. Love, Rebecca. At this time, I would like any of those gathered here, if you have some words you'd like to share, please do. And introduce yourself for the camera as you do. I'm Paul Gotti. Yes. And every other Tuesday with Rick quite a bit. And for years, um, I just want to say thank you to Rick for his being and presence in the universe. Um, I probably first met him in Bible class. We had great time in Bible class. We often went out for meals together. Um, great conversations. I remember uh, one of the really peak experiences recently we had in this care center. We got to talking about birds, and I got my cell phone out, and I started playing bird songs and showing them bird <laughs> We just had two hours of joy just talking about birds. It was one of the best times I had ever been in the care center. There were tough times, of course, too. Rick was often wanting to get out of there to escape, so he could escape, try to escape using his imagination. I came. One time he packed up all his stuff in his room in boxes and taking the pictures down. And he was just certain he was going to be getting on a train to go to New York. And the little care staff were very patient. They were tolerating all that until he started moving all of his stuff out into the hallway. And that was kind of a limit. But, and uh, when they pushed it back in, I kind of got on Rick about that one. And he was pretty upset that week. So that was a hard day. The best days was when I could get Rick take him out under a beautiful weather and we'd go out in his wheelchair and walk down the sidewalk to the green space in front of the and sit on the bench and just be together. And the robins and the squirrels were there and we'd talk about baseball and airplanes and books we were reading. And so thank you, Rick, for loving me and appreciating me same way that I love and appreciate you. You were great friends and not even death what can take that away. Thank you. My name is Dick Bubbs. Uh, Rick, I have some reason to believe you probably can hear what I'm saying. I always treasured how you and I met each other since I only lived a block from church. Frequently I'd stop by, we'd have very short conversations and sometimes Rob would be involved. But I delight Early on, you kind of figured out that I was a middle school teacher, and you lovingly said, I think you found the place where you belong, middle school. So it won't surprise you, Rick, to say that I can stand here today, and as an eighth grader, quote unquote, I can say I pulled it off once again. I used to visit you regularly, and then the longer you stayed there, the less I visited you, and now I come here today. Okay, so that's some middle school wrap up. You know, Rick, I'm very grateful to you um, <clears throat> because you were indispensable in getting my current husband from Japan to the USA. Uh, it was 2014, 13 actually, I went to Tokyo in November and I didn't come back until April of 2014. But I talked to Robert Church and I talked to you and we agreed that all the immigration papers from USCIS, rather than forward them to Tokyo, would come to 802 Ashland. You, Rick, would read them and you would advise us how to continue. And you did that well. 
It was on Christmas Day of 2013 I got a note from you saying our interview at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo was going to be March 9th, 2014. And you made that happen. And that's a gift, uh, Rick, that I will not forget. Also, one reason, Rick, that you will live forever is a strange middle school reason. I didn't realize your name was Frederick until, wow, 2012 or 13. I thought your name was Richard, like mine, Rick. So whenever I say Rick, I think of now or Frederick, okay? I've expanded my horizon here. So you know this middle school person is grateful to you, okay? I didn't betray you. I was forever in middle school. I wasn't predictable, but I am so grateful that you were there to help Shall We and Me be together. I don't think you realize how your legal expertise helped us wiggle through the labyrinth of immigration. Thank you, Rick. May you find peace, as I know you will. Amen. Amen. With James Larson, uh, I got to know Rick shortly after joining Unity back around uh, 2010. Uh, Rick was offering one of his writing classes at that time, and uh, I signed up for it. Uh, so it's, it's one of the uh, amusing things about the, that class I'll never forget is he had a real aversion to use of the word very. <laughs> and as, as much as you think you can su suppress your use of that word, it was, uh, uh, you found, I found that I still got some of my, my compositions back from him where he must have sat down with a stiletto razor and he very carefully would cut out all the berries. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's hard to imagine someone actually doing that, but he, he did it very diligently. So anyways, I've written a great deal in my life as a scientist, but it's, I did learn to, uh, to write better uh, uh, working with him in his writing class. So it's, uh, but uh, I also have fond memories of the, the many times that uh, we had lunch together at Day by Day Cafe. And, uh, um, <clears throat> where he shared many uh, interesting stories about his life and of course we also solved the world's problems and so forth. So anyways, but, uh, um, but I have only fond and good memories of, of Rick. A fascinating, interesting person. It's uh, very knowledgeable, well-read, and it's uh, someone that I could uh, uh, have real down to earth as well as very well uh, based conversation. So anyway, thanks for the memories. I'm sure Dr. Lawson, after every time Rick told you a story, you said that was very interesting. Um, well, actually, I, I did. I, I give you a hard time. I, I did compliment. I'm sure you would, sweetie. I'm sure you would. And actually, he did the same because uh, he also found me to be interesting. I give you a hard time. My name is Al Freshley, and. I have to say that I was really glad to hear all the remembrances that people wrote about Rick because I didn't know him in his salad days. Um, I, I actually got to know him pretty well after he'd had a couple of accidents. He fell on the ice and he hurt his head and he was in transitional care and uh, Rob and I, mostly Rob actually, uh, helped get him into assisted living so he didn't have to live by himself. Um, there were lots of stops and starts to that. Um, it was very, very difficult for Rick to give up his independence and as people have mentioned, he didn't really like being in assisted living. Um, but uh, he was such a challenge always to talk to. He was so smart and so verbal and so able to, to come up with a very good pun, a twist, a different way of looking at everything. Um, yeah, he was a remarkable person in my life. My name's uh, Kathy Seidelts. I'm married to Paul. And Rick was in our Bible class, I think from 2011 to 2017, and picked a passage to have it uh, go over. Once a year, we have a list of 
everything. I so I checked it out. At some point, he wrote his memoir. He passed around a, a copy um, to his friends, and Paul got a copy. And I kind of looked at it, and I realized this is really fun. <laughs> but that's all I remember. And uh, so we, I was happy to see a copy come by again. And so um, since this is my fourth funeral in two months, I'm 70, and I heard this is going to happen. And Rick had this great sense of humor. I went through quick um, and picked out a couple things by the heading that I thought might be funny. So I uh, thought maybe his turkey dressing recipe um, would be humorous, but it was actually very serious at mom. So I went on to my second choice, um, 19 shirts. So Rick was in an artist town in Bali on a trip around the world, something he had wanted to do since a teenager. He had only two shirts in his pack, so he needed a spare, and he was directed to a men's shirt store. Here's Rick's words. There was only one other person in the store, a quiet, easygoing teenage manager who reclined on the chase lounge, played his guitar, and let the shirts sell themselves. <laughs> oh, oh, 19 shirts, it's called. Uh-oh. As I looked around, he says, at this profusion of elegant shirts, carefully laid out, with exquisite designs and patterns, I found myself thinking of several male friends whom I hadn't seen in months. This one would go well with that guy, and this one would go well on the next guy. As I looked, a certain spirit took hold of in me, and I found myself growing ambition. My ambition was become the Gatsby of Ubu. Not for myself, but for the friends I had not seen in months. So, wow, there's a footnote in his memoirs with a quote from the great Gatsby, where Gatsby opens his two hulking cabinets for his suits. Rick goes on after consulting his address book. Once I'd conjured up a solid metal picture of each friend, I sorted through my initial two or three dozen until I found his shirt. Anyway, the story goes on and ends with, the story brings a smile to my face every time I to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms.
we both heard many stories about Rick Coyle um, from Rob and Jan. of love. 